I like to imagine the Hollywood version of this Bible story. <laughs> Breathtaking mountain view, dramatic music, and Jesus then turns into a radiant white figure. And more light and brightness and sparkle and heaven opens and Elijah and Moses step out of a halo of even more light. And then a close-up on Peter. Even though he covers his eyes, the heavenly light penetrates his consciousness and he screams and falls to the ground, shaken by so much holiness. But then, of course, I feel this is not the moment for Jesus and the guys to have a conversation as the Bible suggests. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah talking to each other if, if they would linger around the water cooler. This is not grand enough to be appropriate for this scene. So, as a movie director, I make the decision to discard that bit for a couple of grand gestures, like doing the Charlton Heston. <laughs> and light that sparks and that runs around, around the mountain ridges. And then the climax the cloud and the booming voice of Morgan Friedman. <laughs> this is my son. And then the moment fades, and um, in our story, Peter wanted to catch, wants to catch lightning in a bottle. He wants to build three dwelling places in which Jesus, Moses, and Elijah reside. And maybe a shuttle service to the Temple Mount where God resides, and then to this mountaintop where Peter builds a Vatican equivalent of three dwellings. And when someone has any doubt about any of this, then Peter says, please step this way. And then he opens one or, or three dwellings depending on the severity of the case. And the light show does away with all lingering doubts. He wants to build three dwellings. Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus would have said, build away, my friend. Here I will dwell with you until the end of time. But as it is, we have Hollywood and images, but we do not have a divine light show. We do not see a transfiguration with our own eyes. We just have a story in a book that tells us about a light show that happened once on a mountaintop in a distant land in a galaxy far, far away. No dwellings, neither for Jesus, nor Moses, nor Elijah, and all that's left of the temple is a wall. And accordingly, people are unconvinced. Many people understand the story as a metaphor that points to a greater reality of Jesus' presence everywhere at any time. But then people look around and say, I don't see nothing. And of course, the metaphor enthusiast responds, naturally, you cannot see Jesus with your own eyes. That's why it's called a metaphor. You don't see him, but you can feel him. You can feel him in your heart and in your life. And the metaphors are, can be quite comfortable when life is going right. But when the bitter days are upon us, the metaphors' power to connect us to Christ become a little thin. When we face the un inevitable and brutal truth of our human finitude, we wish that Jesus would rethink the three dwellings idea and make proof of God by divine light show available to us today. But as it is, there is no way around the fact that where is faith, there is also doubt. No dwelling humans can make can free us from doubt. And even back then, no light show, no miracle healing, no star over the manger, no walking on water or turning it into wine. Uh, Jesus did all that, but instead of putting doubts to rest, the crowds wanted more miracles. And then Jesus did more miracles, and it turned out that the people had an unlimited supply of doubt. 
And there was always someone who had not been present when the miracle was happening. And like Thomas needed to touch Jesus' wounds to make sure um, and to shake the fear that all is nothing but an elaborate ruse, a hoax, a futile hope, charlatans in action or good old self-delusion. Yeah, Thomas has gotten a bad rap over times. How could, we ha could he have doubt? But all that he wants is the same that the other disciples had. They had seen the re resurrected Jesus. And of course, their perspective on the resurrection is informed by the real experience of having encountered the risen Christ. Doubt is a Siamese twin of faith. Where one goes, the other follows. And when there is no doubt, then doubt is most likely replaced by delusion, intellectual self-deception, or intentional blindness. This is not something that just postmodern people struggle with who live in a secular world that is dominated by a scientific worldview and where the religious language of the Bible is long out of date. No, this has always been the case. The scriptures testify to the fact that people who deal with doubts seek salvation in something tangible, in something like dancing around golden calves, like making graven image, putting poles on high places, building temples in which God resides, or sacrificing even their children to idols. Our tradition teaches us that God's promises can be trusted, that we are saved by grace through faith, that no matter how much we doubt God, God will not turn God's back on us. But our tradition goes far beyond theological statements that we are to take at face value. Our tradition calls us to participate in a whole framework of spiritual disciplines that find their expression in all we do. These spiritual disciplines help us cope with doubt. And because doubt tends to linger, we need to repeat them over and over and over again, like we worship. This means we meet in community and we use songs and words that countless generations have used before us. This worship experience is not intended to make God happy, who can't live without some creature praising him and bowing down and paying homage. There is nothing we have that God needs. It is the other way around. God has something that we need. And God moves heaven and earth to give it to us. No, this worship experience here is intended to give us Life. It is intended to help us deal with our doubts, to help us pull through the bitter days of life. It gives us hope that the grave is not the final stage in the human life cycle. It is obviously intellectually not difficult to understand that God loves us no matter what. But we keep repeating it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And there is something compelling in the experience of hearing it proclaimed every Sunday that goes far beyond the pure meaning of the word. There is something in the experience of encountering Christ within and under the bread and wine or in the waters of baptism. There is a glimpse of Christ, light show booming voice from the cloud and all in doing church, in the community we built, in being agents of grace, in helping turning this planet into the kingdom of God, in breaking bread and in drinking coffee, and in chatting, chatting to people you would have never met 
if he wouldn't have made the decision to be part of this community. The philosopher Paul Ricoeur wrote, faith is a wager. We put our money in Jesus, but doubt looks us in the face when we do and asks us to follow us and follow doubt into the cold world of materialism where there is nothing beyond the physical. The church is a dwelling of the Holy Spirit. But the church is not a building you built on a mountaintop to keep something holy captive. The church is all of us. As we together journey through life and together struggle through the tension between faith and doubt, the church is people. The church is a living thing. And the faith of our fellow Christians sustain us when our own faith fails us. In their eyes, in the eyes of our neighbors in the pews, we recognize Christ looking back at us. In our neighbors, in the people in the pews, if you look left and right, in them, in those people, Christ resides with us. And the annoying part that also resides in them, that's just human nature. But you know, there's always something. Amen. <laughs>